All righty. I think we're all ready to start. Yes, the woman of the hour is here. And I wanted to start by saying good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone zoomed in from across the globe. This woman has a lot of friends in high places. And hopefully she's all, you know, everyone's going to be joining her this morning or this evening, wherever you are. And we're all friends here. So we're going to keep this casual. We're going to keep it fun. And we're going to just give this woman, you know, the opportunity to talk about her beautiful book and for everyone to find out about it through her as well. So welcome to the online launch of The House on Calle Sombra. My name is Lexi Schultz and I'll be, well, I'm just a friend, helping a friend out. So, and I want her to also be relaxed. Thank you. You're right there. So maybe you wanna just um, say a quick hello to everybody before I rattle off, of course, your, your brief introduction, just to say hi to the people who are already here. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm sorry that it's a Zoom event, but we figured under the circumstances and with people wanting to call in from all sorts of places, this was the best option really uh, to do this kind of thing. And it's also in a way more intimate because it's more direct and it's almost like a one-on-one. -on -one. So I thank you all for being here. Thank you, Lexi, for doing this as well. And I, I hope it's an interesting exchange over the next hour. It'll definitely be. Now, before I give the floor to Marga, let me, of course, give a brief introduction about the woman of the hour. Marga Ortigas has traveled the world as a journalist for three full decades, with a career spanning five continents and two of the largest global news networks. After getting her start in the Philippines, she joined CNN in London, working across Europe and covering the war in Iraq from its inception in 2006. She returned to Manila and the Asia Pacific region reporting from the front lines of armed conflict and climate change as senior correspondent for Al Jazeera. Her extensive coverage of the Muslim rebellion in the Southern Philippines was recognized by the International Committee of the Red Cross for humanitarian reporting. A British Council Chevening scholar as well, Ortigas earned her MA in literature and criticism at the University of Greenwich. She speaks three languages, and is editor of iMigrant, an online platform which showcases writing from the diaspora, advocating a universal humanity beneath people's differences. So at this point, I would like to welcome Marga to give us a little sampling of her beautiful book, The House on Calle Sombra. I know that a lot of you probably haven't picked up your copies yet. It's just arriving in Manila, but I will read to you from the open of the book, it's chapter one. There is a little prologue before it, but I won't read to you from that because it will spoil too much. So here we go. This is the book, House on Calle Sobra. I can't tell you how thrilled I was when I first got this. Uh, chapter one, the house and the gentleman. The house stood at the end of a long cobble drive lined thick with acacia trees. Its leafy marquee of interlocked branches cast a dense network of shadows that moved with the sun. The manor, better said, was within a sprawling estate on a street named Calle Sombra, off the main avenue in the center of Manila. It was far north of the great Poon volcano and just south of the river Pasig, which meandered through the capital towards the bay. The home rose where the tide ebbed, on marshland that became the business district. Over the years, skyscrapers sprouted like reeds, gracelessly dwarfing the large estate. Yet, even up close, from outside, you wouldn't know the mansion was there. The property was bounded by thick concrete walls so high that two ladders were needed to see over them, but no thief or bird would dare. All along the top, shards of broken glass were embedded in the cement like unrefined gems on a crown. The walls themselves were camouflaged in ivy a vertical carpet of dark gray green, dull and unattractive. The bright bougainvillea and colorful plumeria were saved for the gardens inside. The last thing the owners wanted was, for, was to invite onlookers. Not that the creeping ivy could be seen from the street. Bamboo plants nearly three feet deep stood like sentries along both sides of the wall. The only thing missing was a sign saying, keep out. In the middle of the front wall, nearly 20 feet high, were heavy black gates of fortified metal, which concealed a pedestrian entrance and a small latched peephole to the street. It was like a medieval castle, 
exactly as its owners had planned. Well, that was, a, <laughs> did you want to bow? That was a beautiful battling, of course. I mean, I realized that you wanted to use this first part just because a lot of the people who are joining us this morning or this evening haven't quite read the book yet. So yeah. especially um, during the Q&A later for, for those who have joined in, um, if you could kindly just avoid spoilers, maybe she, because if you do have questions about certain characters, because a lot of people are invested in all of these beautiful characters, maybe you could private message, but um, we won't be discussing, you know, actual situations just because we would like to honor the people who will still be reading the book and have just gotten it. So, so yes. Marta, let's go into the interview proper just for, I mean, but again, let's make it light. Let's, let's, you know, it's all, because, you know, we're just starting our day in the Philippines. I'm not sure where everybody is from, but um, yeah, so I think she's had her cold brew and she's ready to go. Of course, I, I did rattle off a, a wonderful resume for, for Marga. So let's look back first, because this is where you got your start, you know, your impressive career as a journalist. I think I've said it before. I think I was sitting with your family for some reason um, during your first um, broadcast. And they were all sitting there so proud. And it was, it was just such a beautiful moment. So did you know that you always wanted to be a journalist? No, not at all. It wasn't part of any kind of plan I initially had. Uh, the first plan was rock star, but I couldn't sing. So that didn't work out. That's fair. <laughs> and in the course of all the failed auditions, um, I eventually met somebody. I was doing communication arts uh, at university because I always knew I wanted to be involved somehow in storytelling, I didn't know in what capacity. So I met someone uh, who knew someone who worked at GMA News at the time of the Iraq war, the very first one in a long time ago. Uh, and they needed part-time journalists or part-time workers really, because at that point, you know, we weren't, we couldn't call ourselves journalists to come in and basically observe CNN, to sit there and just watch CNN for endless hours and then summarize whatever the latest bulletin was out of Iraq or out of anywhere else that was breaking news at the time. And then we would write the copy and deliver it in five minutes between every program at prime time. And that was the start of GMA News Live. And I guess, I don't know if they wanted maybe cheap labor at the time, but they hired us and we were, in our third year of university only. So I was very, very young when I got my start. I keep telling that old former boss of mine that he was insane for taking a chance on a 19 year old, but he did it anyway. And thankfully that's what started my love affair, if you will, with news. But until that happened, which at that time it was a part-time job, which led into a full-time love, uh, I wouldn't have known that such a career really existed. Although having said that, at one point I did watch broadcast news, I think when I was about 15 or something, and it was the role of Holly Hunter who played the news producer. That's the role I wanted. That's the job I wanted, which was to be the person behind the scenes kind of putting the story together, not the one on camera delivering it. So even this particular session makes me very uncomfortable because I'm not talking about the news, but something that I crafted. So it's a bit, you know, anyway. But let's, yeah. just, let's pretend that you're a reporter doing your story. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at this point, though, your time as a journalist here, how did it shape you for your time oh, wow. as a journalist abroad? Because, I mean, you were thrown into the deep end yes. um, really quite quickly, actually. That's actually what shaped me. The fact that they threw me into the deep end. I mean, within a few months, I think that I started with GMA News, Mount Pinatou. with them so I learned a lot just being with them in the newsroom out on the field and I remember my boss then after the day after Pinatubo erupted just kind of said go to Pampa Okay, we're gonna wait for Margaret to come back in because this is this is the world we live in right now. I think she's back. If we can check on Marga, because unfortunately technical difficult difficulties happen. So we're just gonna check on her really quickly. And at this point, I mean, if you do have any questions that you're willing to to ask or share in the chat, 
um, you're very welcome to do so as well because I'll be sending them over to Marga later. But actually what I would really like, where is Marga coming in from? She's actually here in the Philippines at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if she wanted to share her, her geolocation, but I believe she is in the Philippines at this point. So I think she's back. Let's see. Marga, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna spotlight you again. I'm in Manila, hence the unstable connection, unfortunately. Well, I wasn't sure Sorry about wanted, that. That's okay, I wasn't sure if you yeah. wanted to sort of, you know, tell people where you were because it's a mystery, right? But I no, no. I, I'm currently in Manila, thank you, yes. Okay, so let's continue about, um, you were talking about Mount Pinatubo and all of these things yes. that you're also covering here. Which yes. helped save you really as yeah because the they threw me in the deep end and I had no choice but to learn it was either sink or swim so fortunately I I didn't sink too badly or I managed to get back up even if it was dog paddle so that started it and then after GMA I also joined the probe team and on the probe team working under Checha Lasser we basically had to learn every single aspect that went into producing a news story so. You did the research, you did the producing, you did the editing, you did the writing. I, I had to do the reporting as well. And that really is what contributed to how the opportunities might have opened up for me later on when I joined CNN in London. It was because they could throw me anywhere and I could do whatever job was needed. So that well, was very helpful. Well, tell us where you got thrown because you got thrown really quickly too. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, I, I did my master's uh, because of my seven years with Channel 7. I was offered a master's scholarship by the UK, uh, the British Council, and I did my master's in literature and criticism. The reason being that after seven years in journalism, I wanted to hone the craft of storytelling more than news writing or working in news production because I felt like at that point I had had quite a bit of experience already which was invaluable and something that couldn't be taught in a university whereas sitting down and reading at that point I did a lot of postmodern books because that's what I was interested in so to do that in a school setting with other people who had the same interests that was very helpful in terms of learning uh, the complexities of the craft of storytelling so after that I, I wanted to stay in London just because being there, it was just a very different world. And it, it opened up a lot in me. I found it very inspiring. And I remember calling my parents at the time and saying, I know the scholarship is done, but I'd really like the opportunity to stay. And I, my mother uh, had wished that I'd come back home, I know. But my, my father, bless him, just said, well, if you find a way to support yourself while you're there, go for it. You know, I'm all for it. You want to... So I did. I, I worked in all sorts of little odds and ends. I even worked in a wine company at one point selling wine. I, I worked as an assistant in an office, as a PA. I, I did all sorts of things like that just to be able to survive in London and pay for the exorbitant bills until I got the opportunity to work at CNN. And again, I did that because the guy who had become the new bureau chief in CNN London was somebody I had met when he came to Manila uh, and did a talk at GMA7. So I literally wrote him and said, you don't remember me, but you know, I met you X amount of years ago in, in Manila. Uh, could I come and give you my CV? Could I come and you know, have a coffee with you? Something like that. In short, I was just really persistent and makulit. And I think I bugged him for like six months until he finally said, all right, come in. You know, He goes, I don't have anything for you, but I'll keep you in mind. So I went, I had a coffee with him. I, I gave him my CV. And then, you know, heard nothing for a while, but I emailed him all the time, all the time with little things. Oh, I saw this, or, oh, I saw your report on that. That was great, or I, you know. And then eventually there was an opening. It was in the master control room. So basically I worked as the person who switches things and takes care of putting what goes off and what goes on air. Uh, and he said, look, this is clearly not what you wanted and it's not, to the level that your experience is, he said, but it's a full-time job. So do you want a full-time job at CNN? I can get you in the door and once you're in, it's up to you. So I said, yes. And that's what happened. I started there. Uh, the next thing I know, a few years down the line, they were sending me to Iraq. So, 
you did have a lot of interesting stories yes. out there, yeah. but maybe you can talk about some of the life-changing coverages that you did mm -hmm. have. I mean, and what, what they taught you or, yes. you know, I mean, just, just the ones that really stay in your memory and are so vivid to this day. Well, Iraq, I, when I look back on it, I mean, that was the second Gulf War. And to find myself, you know, X amount of years later, working with the very people that I spent endless hours watching, I, I can't even begin to tell you life-changing, to go from admiring these people to being able to call them my colleagues and now my friends. Um, you will see the cover of the book has a blurb from Nick Robertson. And that's because I worked with him in Baghdad and I just have tremendous, tremendous respect for the man. Um, he's one of the most ethical people and ethical journalists I've ever met. So, and he would never have agreed to something like this, except that thank goodness he actually enjoyed the book and thought it was worthwhile because he had to actually get clearance to be able to use not just his name, but CNN on the book. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and while I was in Iraq, I, I uh, also lost two friends. So that was character defining to go from being there when an ambush happens and then losing two very dear friends. I was very, very close to one of them and still being able to work. It, it in a way shows you, you know, the whole sink or swim. I had to swim because at that point I was handling the news desk as well. So many people I felt were looking to me and if I fell apart, you couldn't let down the team, you know? So you had to get on with it and find a space to grieve within all of that. So that uh, taught me a lot. It stayed with me and it's still with me, but it, there was a lot of learning done from that. And being in a war zone like that where every day is kind of life or the death, I think will change anybody. Um, so by the time I came back to Asia for Al Jazeera years later, there were a lot of calamities that I had to cover. Uh, Typhoon Haiyan being paramount. But before that, in December 2006, I don't know if you guys will remember this, Mount Mayon erupted, there was a typhoon and there was a flash flood all at the same time. And it buried villages. It covered Legaspi. I mean, Albay was devastated and we were there. I had never seen so much death because Iraq, although you know it was a war zone, to be in a place where suddenly just there were hundreds of, forgive the graphicness, there were hundreds of dead bodies everywhere you looked. It, it was overwhelming. It was just tremendously overwhelming. And I remember at one point in particular after doing a live shot, because um, you just get on with it. That's what I found. I I've somehow found a way to just get on with it when the job needs to be done you do it and you tell the story and you give it its due and it's res the respect that it deserves. But after that, the minute the camera was off, I picked up the phone and I didn't know what to do with myself. And I called the house, my parents' house and my father answered. And the minute I heard his voice, sorry, I just broke down. I, I didn't know what to say and I just broke down. But that was enough, you know? And I remember it was a very short call because then my cameraman said, come on, we gotta go. And so I was like, okay, pop, that's all. And then, you know, and then that was it. And uh, and you move on with it. So I think it's, the, it's that, it's the fact that you're constantly exposed to the vulnerabilities of humanity and you have to be able to face it. You can't shirk away from it. You can't be jaded. You can't be jaded because if you are, you don't do the person's story that you're telling justice. So um, yeah, so after a while it, it, it it got a little too much. And I think also for my body just started to give in because I had been involved in several car accidents while at work. My back started to ache, the neck started to ache. Uh, so I decided to take a break. And it was when I took that break that Kalia Sombra was born. Exactly. I mean, I was gonna ask you what made you decide to shift gears because I mean, you were so committed and you still are committed to, you know, to the whole purpose and the cause yeah. of, of what journalism is. But, you know, you're also human. And I love that that we saw this side to you, Sorry. because <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. um, you know you you saw a lot. So yeah. is that part of the reason why also you decided to give yourself a break because you you know with mental health yeah. And, yeah. and anything that you did see sometimes you have to be very brave and honest with yourself to say I need to take care of myself now. Yes, you kind of have to listen to yourself because if you don't, you're not doing anybody any favors. 
if you're not in a state to be at your best. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think you let everybody down that way. Uh, but what happened was, yeah, it, I've always wanted to write. I've always wanted, I've just always wanted to do it. I always wanted to have a book. I think, I think ever since I was five years old, I said, I, you know, I want to write. But, and I have, I still have little books that I made as an eight-year-old. You know, I wrote mystery stories that made no sense whatsoever, but boy, did I love doing them. And then I would record them because I had a little cassette recorder. So I would read the stories out loud. And I had my poor sisters as the backup, you know, going, now you do this voice. Now you do this voice. And since they were younger, they had no choice. They did it. You know what I mean? Bless them. And I, I just found those tapes. So that was really quite a surprise. And I'm so pleased that I did because I have these tapes of us as eight-year-olds, five-year-olds, you know, recording these stories that I created at that age. But I never had the courage, I think, to put something that was just purely mine out there. Uh, the thing that I that made news a little easier for me was that it was never my story. It was never something that I created or I crafted. I was putting together somebody else's reality. So I, I really, really enjoyed that aspect of it. I liked putting together the stories. Now, this one, it's from my head. I created it. Everything there I am responsible for. That's absolutely terrifying. And I guess I never had the strength before to kind of just be able to put it out there and say, Pahala na, you know, what happens, happens. And at least I was true to the inspiration of the story and I put it out there and I just hope People are moved by it. I've seen from certain book clubs that I've attended, people are angered by it, but the emotions are very raw and very strong and very powerful in response to the book. So I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that. And I think if I was younger, I wouldn't have been able to write the story and I maybe might not have been able to handle the response to it. Whereas, and maybe your, your siblings who are here, part of the chat and part yes. of the event, they'll probably, you know, you're probably still gonna use the forced labor. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. But I'm sure they they look at it, yeah. look back at it with a lot of you know nostalgia, and they're super proud of you, I'm sure. But what is the difference between a novelist voice and a journalist voice? Do you find that it's melded into one, or do you really put on that different hat? Because you did say it a while ago that these are things that you invent. Yes, it's very different from telling someone's story and giving justice to this person or this event or the circumstance. The 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 interesting about the, the thing about creative writing or writing fiction was that I could just say whatever I wanted without fear of, am I being fair to the other side? Or, you know, you have to have a certain distance when you do news. And I, I still firmly believe that. I know that many, many younger uh, agencies or journalism practitioners might not be of that mindset anymore, but I am still of the old school that I am there to report the news, not participate in, in it. I might be a witness, but I am not an active participant in the event that I am witnessing. Uh, so when I do the news, there is that distance, if you will, to reporting the story. Whereas with this, I mean, it comes from your head. It can't get any more intimate in a sense. So you're freer to say things that you wouldn't if you were reporting. But at the same time, what I've noticed is the style that I now write in is very much almost honed by doing broadcast. So the sentences are shorter. Um, there's a lot of shorthand. And uh, I like to keep the pages moving because I, don't, I didn't want to write something that would bore me as well. So that's why the style of the book is the way it is. Well, they do say that if you intend to write a book, it has to be a book that you want to read. Yes. That, that's the starting point. Exactly. But talk about your journey of the five years because you know it, it just seems as though Nine months ago, you started the idea and then plop, you have a book, right? I mean, of course, now it's all the roses and the, you know, excited to have the book in your hand. But that's, to write a book is not easy. I mean, to no. some, it's natural, but yeah. I mean, to others, it's very difficult. So talk about the journey of, of the idea to, you know, using those five years. Well, to the idea was first born. I, I was still working with Al Jazeera at the time and uh, my cameraman, was not Filipino, he was British. So every time, you know, so there were a lot of things in the Philippines that I would find myself, it was interesting because I would have to be explaining it to an international audience 
in terms of news. So it was it was good training because you always speak to a wider audience. Do not presume that your audience knows what you're talking about. So that was very uh, helpful training. And then I literally had him with me in the office, in the car. So if there was something that he saw that was interesting that I might not have found interesting because I grew up with that or whatever, I suddenly thought, oh yes, you're right. You know, So we would always drive down McKinley Road and cut through some of the heavily guarded villages where a lot of the wealthy in Manila live on our way to the less uh, fortunate sections of the city, shall we say. And I remember one time he said, look at these houses. I mean, I haven't even seen houses like this in the UK. I mean, they looked like castles, right? But many of them, and, and they stood out because of the state they were in. He said many of them were run down and like clearly abandoned. And he just kind of said, what would lead a house like that to ruin? Like why would something that clearly cost millions and millions to build be left in such a state? Like, how does that happen? And uh, I remember I was sitting down with my sisters, I think, and some cousins, and we were talking about, oh, did you see the house on the corner of such and such and such and such? It's abandoned now, clearly, because you see the post hanging out of the gate. There, you know, the weeds were everywhere. And we were just talking about, oh, didn't this family live there? Oh, yeah, what happened to them? Oh, the grandmother died, and oh, the this died, or, you know, and so that, that whole concept of a family and then the family homestead that might become abandoned because of the things that happen within a family throughout the generations just became really interesting. And especially in the Philippines, and as I've learned from one of my book clubs, which had uh, readers from other parts of the globe, they, which i very pleased they pointed out that it, it might seem like a very Filipino story, but it isn't because it resonated with them too. Why? Because families are universal. The concept of a family, obviously, is the basic social unit, right? So that's universal. And what we're looking at here is a family rooting its identity to a home, to a land, to a piece of land, you know? And then where do you go from there? So in that sense, that's also why if you read the book, you will notice that I didn't repeat Philippines in it many times. It doesn't refer to the Philippines a lot or the Filipinos because I did want that story to have that almost that sense of a parable, you know, that it's not it's not realistic. It's not meant to be fact. It's not meant to be reportage. It, it's somewhere in a level in between. Um, so that's that's how the story came to be. And so basically after I took my sabbatical, which has become five years, uh, the story started. So I started writing this five years ago and it took me three years to get it completed before I submitted it around to find a publisher. And even then, once I had submitted it to the publisher and they had said they wanted it, before we actually started the process of editing it with the publisher's people, I myself had continued to shape the story until it is what it is now uh, in print. And I think if the story had stayed with me, I probably would still be changing it. So it's a good thing they took it out of my hands, but yeah. Well, I was, the next question would be about what the house on Calle Sombra is about, but you sort of already gave yes. us a sort of inkling into what exactly the book is about, but blatant on the cover. And I, you know, I have to ask this question, obviously, is the word parable because yes. it's almost, I mean, it's not as big as the, as the title, but it's there, right? Yeah. So. Because it, would you like to stress that it is fictitious? Because obviously yes. people in the country will be reading it and it'll be very familiar to them, right? Or is it, you want people to know that it's a cautionary tale with a lesson? Yes. Or both? I both. Mean, I'd like to see it. Yes. I, for some reason, when I came up with it, when the title came to me, it just immediately came a parable it just followed straight away because I didn't, you know, like you see all these novels that come out and it's like, so-and-so, a novel. I mean, part of me is like, really? I mean, it's fiction and it's there in a book, but it's a novel. So I didn't want it to be, I just did not feel right to do that. And I just thought the way, the tone of the whole story, I wanted you to have an idea or a hint of what you were getting when you picked up the book by putting it right there on the cover. Because the whole tone of it, is like that. It's a parable. It's a cautionary tale. It's not a deeply rooted in fact, you know? So I didn't even want to put it, it in many ways, it takes from reality uh, a sense of truth, but it is not factual. 
otherwise. Do you know what I mean? So I know many people have said, but this is all very familiar. But funnily enough, or interestingly enough, people of different generations read different things into it, which is great, you know? Um, and if it feels familiar, great. But it's not in any way uh, a fictional representation of real people. I, I don't want it to come across as that. But cautionary tale, definitely. Uh, there are certain characters that will seem familiar because we see them in the society over and over again. And again, different generations have come to me saying, oh, well, this sounds like so-and-so. And then somebody, say, oh, somebody else will say, oh, no, 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 it actually sounds like so-and-so. So the fact that there's also generational references says a lot, I think. So when you, because you did say that you wanted it to have a very universal appeal, even though obviously the people of the Philippines will take it to, to have to be their own, right? Because yes. everything is all too familiar, really. Yes. But do you feel that the international market can actually get a glimpse into Philippine history? I'm not saying historical fact, right? Yes. But I mean, this is very much the, the way the Philippines operate. Yes. I, that's, I, a lot of my, uh, I, I had a few people from the Philippines read it beforehand. Uh, you know, Ms. Checha Lazaro, who I'm sure many of you know, also got an advanced copy of the book. She's on, she's on the back of the book as well. I'm, I'm really pleased, you know. Um, Danton Remoto has read the book. I, I gave it to people in the Philippines uh, first, of course. But then when I sent it out for reviews from uh, people externally, I was, I was worried. I was worried also about what the publisher's editors would say because they were not from the Philippines. And the fact that they didn't have questions then I felt that I, I got the job done right. Because for many, it, it still resonated. It felt familiar to them. To others, it felt transportative, like they finally understood what a country like the Philippines might be like beyond the stereotypes that might be seen in Western media. Um, and then there are those who just felt like in and of itself, it was interesting whether the country existed or not was almost secondary to the fact that they were carried along by the story. So I, I am just pleased really that overall, nobody said, I got lost halfway through. I don't know what it was talking about. So and you have a lot of characters in there. So, yes. you know, I mean, it's, it can easily be that people will get lost and say, what's this? Because you don't have timelines. A lot no. of times when it's um, spanning the generations, um, some authors choose to put sort of um, family tree and just to get people sort of on track if they sort of get lost. But in this one, you, you don't get lost because even the, the jumping back in time and all of this sort of, it, it all just happens to make sense. I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but I you did want to also expound on the fact that people will be tagging particular, you know, political yeah. figures <laughs> or people in society to certain characters. But you say that there is not one character in there who is a particular person because it's really yeah. an amalgamation of, yes. of different people. Of the characters that you meet or like, you know, in over the last 11 years of working with Al Jazeera, a lot of time was spent crisscrossing the Philippines from north to south and many characters I found repeated throughout the country. So, you know, people will say, oh, well, this is very clearly this person. And I'm like, well, yes, but you know, I met characters like that also in the south or also in the central islands or also way up north there was somebody like that. So it is, an, it is, as you said, an amalgamation of many characteristics that I encountered that maybe I found interesting or that maybe I found challenging or problematic. And so I explore it further uh, in dealing with it in the book. And the reason also I didn't, I know some people have said, actually only two or three people have said, why did you put a family tree? You'll figure that out when you get halfway through the book, why there isn't a family tree, because I would like the reader to discover the characters as they come. And if you put a family tree, you spoiler it like right from the start. And I, I didn't want to do that because I, it also gives you an expectation. And I've always found like putting family trees at the front of the book, not really very helpful for me because I like to dive in and then I discover who they are, you know? And if, if I need a tree to help me keep track, then I will make it, you know? But I didn't want to put it out there and uh, ruin the surprise, <laughs> you know what I mean? Ruin the storytelling, so that's why. Exactly, I mean, but I did want to highlight maybe one character because it is Women's Month. 
Oh, yes, of course. I'd love to talk about the matriarch without giving away spoilers, obviously, but I think it is uh, common knowledge that she is of Muslim descent. She is, she is a Muslim lady, beautifully written. And it's so lovely how you see her in such a different light because unfortunately, well, yeah, I don't want to give away too much, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, she's not the regular, you know, sort of stereotypical Muslim woman that, that we see because in the end, you really see her as just woman, which is so beautiful. That, that for me was very important because um, I spent a lot of time as well in Mindanao and I know very many women like that there who don't get a fair shake, uh, don't get the stage, you know, or aren't even visible. It's like that. People people just hear, ay, Bangsamoro, or oi, Moro from the South. I remember the first time I went to Mindanao, people in Manila were like, are you sure you want to go? Do you need a passport to get there? And the thing is, once I got to Mindanao, I got the same thing. I'm in Mindanao. I think I've never been there. You know, I think I need a passport to cross over. They don't get us. They don't understand. They think we're this. They think we're that. And so over the years, you know, you get to know them. And there was one particular woman who I met in a rebel camp who, you know, fed me lunch, sat with me. We had buka juice together and just started talking to me about her family. And I remember, you know, she was sitting there and she had a weapon and her kids were all rebels. They were underage, but they were all armed, you know, and she just kept telling me she wanted out of the fighting and she wanted more for her children. And it was just not a conversation. I, I did, in the end, I did ask her to say that on air and we did a new story featuring her, but you don't normally see that, you know? You hear the rebel groups and you just see these men with the beards or the eye patch or whatever it might be. And here was this woman saying, oh, I'm tired of this, but they killed my husband, you know? So I've got to pick up the gun and fight. And at the end, my kids don't even know what they're fighting for anymore. And it was just a very, that was, I think, the beginning of how I started to look at the conflict very, very differently. And also at that time, realizing that the generation had changed in Mindanao. So the original fighters were no longer the people who were carrying arms and those that were carrying arms were ready to lay them down because they didn't know what the heck was going on any more than the military in Manila knew at the time because generations were changing, you know? So, so I, I, it was very important for me to have a character like that. I mean, she just so wonderfully written. So at this point, what exactly would you want your readers to take away? from from reading this book apart from being very curious about the characters and just really for, for Filipinos anyway right being very um familiar is the word that just happens to always pop in because it, it just feels that way it feels like you're living yes. in it again in a way I think I'd like for people to look at it and maybe see themselves or see somebody they know or question their space in the society that they occupy and maybe look at people who they might not know on a day-to-day -day basis and just feel a kinship with them. Because ultimately we all occupy the same space and we're all kin, you know? So if you look at somebody as just a human being, maybe dressed differently, maybe you think with different wants, but we're all the same in the sense that we all want something, we all fear something, and we all love something. And that is universal. I mean, that's, that's really just so well said. But um, before we head on over to questions from the chat box, or I mean, this is your chance to talk to Marga, to chat with her. Well, not in the flesh, but virtually anyway, she'll answer your questions. It would be so great. What you can do is actually, there are these um, emojis or what you call the reaction button. So if you do, if you would like to talk to Marga, kindly raise your hand via the reaction button and we'll definitely get to you. Um, Catherine maybe can, can direct us in, in who exactly would like to ask a question and then I will be unpinned and this person will come in to be pinned. But I also, I know you're an avid, um, well, Kindle, you, you like reading online, Marga. It's, I prefer the smell of books. I mean, but no, me too. I know, Trust but me, guys, the book is the book is nicer than the Kindle. Exactly, right? That's what yeah. I mean. I was gonna fight for the book because you know, remember when you're like, oh my god, you don't even have Kindle. What what's wrong with you? And I'm like, because it's just not me. But where do you see reading going? Is is it already in that direction? Because for me, I'm still a lot of um, you know, 
there was a problem obviously during the pandemic every industry got affected yeah. you know the the whole publishing of books you know the industry slowed down but yes. then we've got online that also pushes all of these things forward so where do you, you know what there was there was a really interesting app that i it was still in the testing stage and i honestly i should look at it because i don't know what's happened to it since but what they were trying to do was make reading an interactive experience so it was sort it, I, it was sort of like a kindle so you had the text but the text came with sound effects and it moved and it's like when you reach certain parts of the book there was visual effects as well um clearly they weren't going very quickly with it because it was very difficult to produce such a book but i just thought it was really interesting to kind of so i don't know if that's where it's going because obviously we've got the audiobooks which is just for the for to hear and then you've got the kindle which is just visual but this one tried to marry the two with the addition of the moving images so i don't know it's interesting but is that what readers want because i know very very hardcore readers who will still any day of the week go out to a bookstore and prefer that copy any day so i don't know, you know? well it could be a generational thing but i do have a <laughs> year old so she's gen z right i mean yes she is gen yeah. z and she still even though she's read it online she still wants to get a copy of it so i mean i i'm not sure i don't know if i can see magical things happening in front of me <laughs> right it's weird maybe it's maybe i'm just old -er. people are shy but i see is that my brother raising his hand yeah. you guys want to so, meet my brother yeah at this point um we can unpin me and then bring in whomever has a raised hand for, for any questions because so far on the chat, I don't see any, yeah. uh, I don't see any brave souls or, you know, usually the chat box is for the shy souls who just, you know, want to use me as a conduit to ask the question. So maybe Anton can go first and then we'll wait for the chat box to have some questions. Ooh, Anton, go ahead. Okay, go. I see. Hi, good morning. Oh, there. Okay, let's go, Anton. You want to I, just turn your a, I just had a yeah. question in the back of my head for the past few days. I just wanted to know if you identify with anyone in the book the most. Do you identify with anyone in the book? Me? Not particularly. Well, I I have I I don't need to have a favorite character, but I there was a character I really enjoyed writing, and that is same as Lexi, um, the matriarch of the book, Fatima. I just, I, I just really, really enjoyed writing her. So she appears in the very first chapter. So she's there from the start. And I, I think because she is one of the more complex, I suppose, uh, her, I, I just, she, she's one of my, she's very close to my heart. Well, where did Anton go? I would love to see him the last time right. I saw him. There you go. <laughs> okay, I'm a bit shy when it comes oh, to the okay. camera. <laughs> the last time I saw you, I think I was smaller. And yeah, I see a question here. Yes, I am planning a second one. It is not a yeah. sequel, but I'm in the middle of trying to plot it out. The problem is like when I started Calia Sombra, I, I, you know, the plan was all in place. I knew where I was going. With this one, I have the beginning, I have all the characters, I have the world, but I don't have my end yet. So I'm struggling a little bit, but I wanted to give myself less time to write this. I wanted this done by the end of this year, because seeing now how long it takes to get a book out, it took five years. I mean, three years to write Sombra. The whole publishing process took two years. So, you know, it wasn't as quick as I might have expected originally. So I would like to get a second book down. But have you started it, Marks? Have you started yes, it? Yes, I have. I have started it. I have my opening scenes. I have my outline generally. I just... I just I'm missing certain portions that can't get me over some humps. So right, yeah. because well, obviously for people who have read the book, I mean, is it bad to say that there is an opening? Because I think a lot of a lot of books sort of close the close the chapter, yes. close the story. But oh, but this won't be a sequel though. Not it, a sequel. It'll be a completely different book uh, set in the same general region of the world. So it will still be in Southeast Asia predominantly. But it will not, you know, be centered on the Philippines or be focused on just one family, for example, or anything like that. But it will be something else that might be culturally relevant. I see another hand raised. Oh, perfect. Yes. Come on. Let's not be shy. We've been talking for quite a while. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, my question. What I loved about the book was all the twists and turns that you didn't expect and even how the characters evolved and popped up. And I was afraid to ask the question because it might be a spoiler. But spoiler. 
But my question would be, okay, so there are all these things that pop up, right? Did you know they were coming up before you wrote the book or did they just also appear to you while you were writing the book? You know, some, actually, now that I think about it, they popped up as I wrote the book. I had an outline and I had chapter breaks. Like I knew this chapter will talk about this. This chapter will talk about that. This chapter will talk about this. But I didn't have like, okay, this is where this chapter will end. And then I will start the next chapter on this. I didn't. So I would write the chapter. And then when I, I wouldn't even have a plan as to where the chapter would end. It would just feel like, oh, okay, that's the end. Okay. Okay. Then I would leave it at that. And then I'd have the opening for the next chapter. And that would just come inevitably. And in fact, there were certain portions where there were chapters that were originally not part of the chapter grid that came to be because of the way the chapter before it ended. And then maybe like one third of the way through the book, I just, the book took on a life of its own where it, they became real people in my head and I would wake up like with this need to get back to the laptop because they were already like noisy, you know? Sounds not exciting. Saying, I'm not saying, I don't have voices in my head, but you know what I mean? But it was like, okay, I got to sit down because I see this scene and I'm just going to sit down and type it all out. So that's kind of what happened. Wow. And yeah. That must have been an exciting process. It was. I really enjoyed it. And by the end, you kind of miss them, which is why like I, the sound, the soundtrack that I had or the playlist that I put together for me to get in, in the mood for the book, I've shared also on Spotify. So for people who kind of want to be more immersed in the world of the book, that playlist is out there. Um, to make them a little more real because to me they were so real like I could see them you know yeah thank you <laughs> you're welcome thank you for being here <laughs> thank you so much for that um we do have a question on the chat box from Bambi C hi Bambi hi Marga didn't ask this when we met but would you want this book turned into a movie and who would you cast locally? <laughs> well that's that's a fun question that's <laughs> a lot of characters man yeah ah hmm Pressure, no? I it would be interesting only because I guess I did when I wrote it, I saw it visually. So it lends itself to that, I think. I don't know. I don't know if, if you could fit 38 pages in a movie, but um I did have actually a cast in mind because when I was first trying to flesh out the characters, I made myself not just a fat, I made myself a family tree, like complete with dates. So I knew where each of the character where each of them was at any given point in the fictional timeline. And then I had to put faces on them so that they could become real and then the personalities would flow better for me. But then my cast was a mix, not just Filipino actors, but I had international actors there as well. So, you know, Fun. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so it was totally a mix. Um, honestly, for, this, is, this has been uh, the bone of contention now with several people who have read the book and have had book clubs and told me who they envisioned for Fatima. My vision for Fatima originally was uh, Lisa Lorena, or Liza Lorena. I can't remember now how, how she would pronounce her name. But that was who I envisioned for Fatima because she just has a certain regal bearing to her. Yes. You know? Well, the, that would be a great one to cast for, for Fatima. Right? And Cesar I think Mucano, she's yeah. I don't know where she is, though. Right? <laughs> Yeah, but we have so many good actresses that, I mean, but Fatima needs to be correct. Like, you yeah. got to get it just right. But, but yes. then we do have another question. Bambi, thank you so much for the question. Um, so you were part of the book club. I'm glad you super enjoyed it. Hi, Sandra. How are you? Sandra Ramos is with us, of course. Why did you choose those particular you. historical eras as the context for the three generations in the book? Did you handle the historical context as fiction or nonfiction? Um, I had, you know, it was super, I just felt like in the history, particularly of a country like the Philippines, those three eras, you know, you have World War II, then you have, uh, I'm gonna give it away, but you have, you have certain national traumas, let's put it like that, that might take on different details, but the core of them is the same. The violence in them is the same and the damage that they might do to a nation's psyche is the same. And so I chose three particular eras taken from reality, but fictionalized in the timeline. But the sense of them, I mean, when you read it, it will resonate as true. 
and I meant it to be like that. And that's that's why I chose those three particular uh, eras, because they mirror the the what happens within the family is mirrored in society. And I wanted that the kind of sway together, because it's also a sense of like generational traumas in family repeating itself until the cycle is broken. And it's the same with a nation, which is really just a larger family with its own set of traumas that repeat themselves. So that's why I, I chose those three things. Thank you, Marga. Congra congratulations on your book. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much. National Bookstore, everybody will have the book soon. So thank you very much, Sandra, for your Next support. week. Next week. There you go. That's awesome because a lot of people obviously are asking as well when it's available. I mean, we were talking about it since since late last year, Marga, and you were just waiting, waiting for, for the <laughs> physical baby to come, right? And how was that feeling when you finally got it? Because I mean, as as I mean, as an aspiring author as well, and well, I'm not sure there are aspiring authors here. I'm that that instance, it's like really saying she's a great author. I've read some of her stuff. It's very good. I'm just putting that out there now. Very far, far away. But anyway, I mean, you say five years, eh, might be 10. I don't know. Trying to make it shorter. But really, how did it feel to you to see that? that well, as some of you are aware, I was so overwhelmed when the, I, I didn't expect it. But the publisher sent me a sample box of books. Um, and I didn't know that they were doing that until it arrived. So when it did arrive and I realized what it was, I was alone at the time and I, you know, we were on lockdown and I didn't know what to do and I didn't know what to, you know, so I ended up doing an Instagram live so that my siblings and everybody else could partake in the excitement of this. And then eventually I realized, wait, I can do a group call. So I called my family um, and I said, look, the books are here, you know, and they were like, yeah, I'm having breakfast. What? No, I'm just kidding. But I just, you, you do, you feel the need to share it because for me, it was really a childhood dream come true. And it's just, firstly, I was shocked at how thick it was. I mean, man, that's a lot of words. And this is cut down. My original manuscript was a bit longer than this. So, you know, but, and then to see this painting, I got to tell you a little bit about this cover, guys, because this was a painting that belonged to my parents. And it just filled me and all of my siblings always with such joy. And it used to hang in uh, one of the spaces in our family home. And, uh, and it just felt so appropriate for the cover of this book because it's a window, you know, and there's all of these colors on it, but it's really just because inside is really just a glimpse, a tiny glimpse to a more complex reality. So I wanted that reflected in the cover and there you have it. Well, there is a question on the chat, but let, let me sort of rephrase it. So obviously everyone in the Philippines can get a copy, will get a copy. What if some people assume that you're talking about them? Well, I mean, I, I are you ready for that? Like, was, did that ever cross your mind? Because I mean, really, I, did. I, 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 I honestly, I, I really only considered it because a lot of people felt very, um, what's the word for it? Like they were, that certain people were referred to. So they were like, oh, but you're talking about this person. I'm like, well, I'm actually really not. But I understand if some people might take certain things personally, uh, especially the public figures, you know, but it's a fictional book. These are fictional characters. Again, as I keep saying, it's an amalgamation possibly of characteristics that we see in our public space over and over again. So one person might take it a certain way, but I bet you that somebody else will also think it's them, you know? So what can you do? Um, it's a work of fiction. If somebody feels alluded to, then maybe they should ask themselves why. And if they like what they see, then well, hey, good for them. And if they don't, then take another look, right? It's a question of conscience at this yeah. point, right? Exactly, exactly. Because exactly. if you said historical fiction, then, then maybe. But yes. this is obviously a parable, right? Yes. So this is why this is um, a very important fact to bring out there, that it yes. actually is really a parable and it, it was created in your mind, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's also in the book, I think there's a major disclaimer on the first page, you know, the usual. The characters yeah. in this book. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. This is in the end, really. I mean, but I really, I, I, I'm appreciative of the fact that they resonate so much as real because I was trying to capture a sense 
of a personality. You know what I mean? So it's not a person, but personalities that exist and that I've encountered way too often in, in the work as a journalist. So, yeah. All right. So are there any other questions from, from our very shy, from our very yeah. shy audience today? Come on, guys. I hate talking about myself. And come on. Oh, you I, do see a lot of an hour. I see a lot of smiles. So that's good. Okay. I'm sure that a lot of them are, if they don't have the book already, they are going to get it after, after today. No? No. Thank you all no. again for your time. I just want to say thank you. Well, I was going to give you a minute after to, oh. to say thank you. We're okay. waiting for maybe one or two more questions if, if people are open to it. And if not, um, we, can, we can end it with um, your, your final message for everybody. I just want to say Miss Lizasso because she's always on my Instagram. And I'd, I'd like to say hello. And if you have anything you want to ask, Hi. please. Hi. <laughs> I don't <laughs> ask anything. I just okay. want to say... Um, congratulations again. <laughs> and I, I really love the book. It's very, very it's, an eye, it's, it's really an eye opener. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. So I put you on the spot. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But she was the one I actually caught smiling the whole time. So it was just right that you put her on spotlight. So yes, Mars, I think um, at this point, people are curious enough or if they already have the book, they're going to start the minute we finish. So yeah, just send them off with, with your happy thoughts and, and your gratitude. Because I, in the, at the end of the day, you know, to have your own book, this is such a special thing. I mean, I'm, I'm talking maybe as someone who would like to experience it too. Um, I'm not sure how everyone sees it, but this is such a special gift. So I'm congratulations to you. I'm very proud of you. Um, and you're already doing your second book. So I'm warning you, the white hair will be coming in. Um, <laughs> so just, yeah, send us off with, with whatever your final message. I just is. wanted to say thank you. Thank you to you, Lexi, for, for agreeing to sit with me and do this again. Um, thank you to all of you for your time on this Saturday morning to sit and talk about a book, which I know that some of you have already read. And for those of you that haven't, I hope when you do get your copies that you enjoy the read or are moved by it or are angered by it or whatever it is. Um, but really it's just meant to be a cautionary tale, holding up a mirror to all of us. And you know, we take from it what we will. But thank you all for your time and thank you for your support. All right. With that, we end the online launch of the House on Calle Sombra. And Marx, notice we're very Christmassy. I and know. Oh, yes. Christmas in Calle Sombra is, is a big thing, right? So, I mean, that's not, that's not a spoiler. No. So, yeah. in the end, it, it all sort of worked out. But once again, congratulations to you. Felt like it needed it. You know, you can't have a story about the Philippines without a Christmas scene in it. Absolutely not. I mean, with paroles all over the place and, you know, just <laughs> we are who we are as a nation, right? So without also just saying that Calle Sombra can't be, um, can't, other people from other countries can't relate because again, in the end, more than it being about a country, it's about a family. Yes, exactly. All right. So thanks Thank again, you. everybody, Thank for spending your, your morning with us and for the people in L.A., where is your glass of wine? I don't see any. So, I mean, it's too early out here, but it's six o'clock somewhere. So, you know, have a drink. Have a I'll show you my glass of wine. <laughs> I was going to tell you to do a shot of tequila before to sort of take the edge off. But you know what? If it's a glass of wine, that's fine. Um, so once Cold brew and a glass of highball. How about that? A highball glass. Was there a shot in there of something? No, nothing. Okay. <laughs> Oat milk. Like it's, it's, you are coherent. Don't worry. <laughs> Once again, thanks a lot, everybody. This has been Lexi Schultz. And of course, the House on Calle Sombra will be available in National Bookstore next week. So do get yourselves a copy. Thanks again. Enjoy your Saturday, everybody. Thank you.